By the time John Maselli flew his first mission on February 26, 1945, the end of the European conflict was only a few months away. Of course, none of the troops knew this, and even if they had, it would mean little to the millions still fighting and dying every day. At age 18, while stationed at an Air Force base in Hardwick, England, John Maselli kept a journal of the 13 missions he flew, and describes them now in his own words. Well, we really picked a good one for our first Berlin. We took seven and a half hours, and the most of it was on oxygen. We saw a lot of flak, but it wasn't very near us. Uh, our crew that came here with us had two engines knocked down, so they went on to Russia. And they were transformed to the 15th and the 1st and we had a tailwind of over 100 knots going in, but we had to buck it all the way back. And yes, it was funny to get our first one on my brother Tony's birthday. As for that damaged plane seeking assistance from Russia, they were one of the first to test that new agreement. And it turns out getting help from our former enemy wasn't as simple as it sounds. They weren't uh, shot down, they were hurt, and they didn't think they'd make it back to England, so they went on to Russia. Mm -hmm. And we had an agreement with Russia to do that. Mm -hmm. So they were one of the first that did. But Russia did not authorize us to f send a plane to pick them up and bring them back. Mm -hmm. So they had to stay with the Russian army until they worked their way back through Turkey. Mm -hmm. So it was several months. In fact, by the time we were ready to go home, when the war ended in Europe, they had just gotten back. One mission down, but there were many missions to go before a member of the 8th Air Force Division could go home. Daunting, given the high amount of risk every time you took to the sky. It was 35, mm. and if you flew, flew lead crew, it was 30, mm. say five missions. But we, were, we flew maybe five or six missions, and then we were asked to become a lead crew. Mm. And uh, I, I don't know the circumstances, because we weren't informed, but our pilot was a very good uh, pilot in that he flew very, fir very close to the one next to him, and maybe that's why we got to be lead crew. Best to simply stay focused on the next mission. Our second mission was another of the biggest targets, Magdeburg. And we had to bomb through clouds, and I believe we missed the target because the next day we had to go back to Magdeburg. And that trip took seven and a quarter hours, the way I saw it. And we were again on oxygen most of the time. And we missed most of the flak, so we weren't too damaged on our way back. But the next day, the third mission was also to Magdeburg. Mm. But that day was the only mission that we could see our target below us. And we could see our bombs hitting the train station, <laughs> or huge um, civil ci city buildings like, mm -hmm. and the, maybe the gas works, but, uh, and there were a few f enemy fighters in the area, but none attacked us. They usually attack in loose formation, but we did have cover all the way with P-51s, and this was a visual target and in the only one that we saw the target uh, hit when our bombs were dropping on them. And it took seven and a half hours, we see a flak, and we were on oxygen most of the time. And flak was quite heavy, but we were quite far from it. And uh, we never had to go back to Magdeburg, so okay. we must have hit our target pretty well. Flak, mentioned often in John's journal, was the Nazis' land-based weapon of choice, and the flight crew's worst nightmare. 
that Black night. were 88 bombs that went off, right, mm -hmm. all over us. And they could be set to go off at certain heights. Mm -hmm. So they had fuses on them. And, and that's what was the scary part, was that if they found your exact height that you were coming in on, those bombs went off at your exact height. And uh, that was very dangerous because uh, that could knock out a plane easily, you know. And that wasn't even, so it wasn't even necessarily getting hit by the bomb, but they had shrapnel in them too? Yeah, they had shrapnel in Yeah, this, this bomb would break up into so many strips of little sharp pieces of steel that would cut right through the aluminum. And of course it could damage your engine very well, but, uh, or cut through. I had this helmet that I had borrowed once, and it had a cut right in the helmet, so it, it was pretty sharp steel. The threat in the sky wasn't just from planes and guns. Without the aid of modern technology, in World War II, something as simple as clouds could be a killer, which sadly happened all too often. Today we had a pretty easy target, but weather didn't permit it. We were supposed to hit a jet field just outside of Schwanbosch Hall, but we could not go all the way because of contrails. And the B-17 formation almost hit us. We were almost hit by bombs and other planes. We left the formation and came back on our own. What would happen is we'd come through a cloud where there was our formation and we come out and there was an opening and a B-17 formation was coming at the same height so the planes went every which way to avoid hitting themselves hitting each other and uh, so we, we, we broke up the formation we dropped our bombs and we were sweating out gas on our way home, but we didn't know where the bombs hit and they were all well over Germany. Right at the front of the plane, the nose gunner would have a terrifyingly clear panoramic view of this near-death experience. But while they couldn't spot other planes, they weren't completely blind. The 8th Air Force Division had been given a newly designed type of ground mapping radar to test, the first of its kind H2X radar. It was given to the lead plane of each squad in the 8th to help pinpoint the targets, even on cloudy days. Kind of like a radar scope that would, would go through the clouds. And, and what it would do, it would bring out, the rivers would stand out, and the autobahns, which the Germans had built, would stand out almost like rivers. So you could follow that if you were... If you were the navigator and you were coming in and there was too much clouds to see, you could pick up a river and follow that in or, or a, a, an autobahn. Then, as it is now, even training could be deadly. With the threat of decoy bombers, one missed communication could result in getting shot down by your own side. In the fifth mission, March 9th, we really had a swell one for today. It was our shortest and our first in our ship, oh, 409th Ship Y. So it was our, we had just been assigned to Y ship called Gambling Lady. Ah, the mission only took three and a half hours and only three hours on oxygen. The target was a railroad yard at, at Rhine. It was Gambling Lady. Gambling Lady had about 90 missions. Oh, wow. I have pictures of Gambling Lady. The target was a railroad yard at, at Ryan. But yesterday we had a practice mission and we were looking down through clouds. The ship flying on our right, K Patches, which had almost 100 missions, it was shot down by the Limeys. That's what we heard, and Lieutenant Reed was the pilot. Most of the crew were killed. John explains why the English would intentionally shoot down one of our own. Identification, friend or foe. So each day before we went on a mission, 
the uh, powers that be would issue a code uh, for you to come back in on. So when we left, we would pick up the new code for that day. Now say it was a, a dot, 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 or something like that. And if, as you were coming back over England, mm -hmm. you had to identify yourself as an, an American or a mm -hmm. British ship. Sure. Or else they were going to shoot at you because they thought you were enemy coming over. And the Germans had done that. They captured some ships once and then they flew over England and they got past the uh, identification thing mm. and then they were bombing us with our own plane. Mm. So they had to set up something to avoid that. And so we had this identification friend or foe and when you came back, you had to show this or give it off mm -hmm. so that the radar, the British radar, would identify you as an American coming back and in. Did they not do that or what happened there? Well, the one outfit mustn't have gotten their uh, code mm -hmm. uh, patch. Uh, so they were coming back and they didn't show their uh, ID. So then the Limey shoot at you a brutal reminder of just how crucial communication was during World War II. Armsburg was today's target. This was sixth. Mm. We went over Belgium and France and it only lasted six hours and ten minutes and the only, only a couple of hours on oxygen. We were back before noon. There was a swell mission, only a few bursts of flak and I didn't see any. That was uh, the sixth mission. Seventh mission was March 11th. We hit another heavy target today, Kiel. The target was the shipyards and subpens. It was another short one, six hours, 25 minutes, but the flak was heavy because you were near a shipyard. Mm. But the chaff and the screening force made their radar inaccurate, so that stuff was working mm -hmm. for us. But March 12th was the 8th mission. Today we had a long trip, 8 hours, 25 minutes, and just about all over water. This was the first place the Russians had asked us to bomb. The target was Schweinmundi. It was a, a shipyard in Poland. Mm. We hit something because we saw smoke coming up through the clouds. So we had to bomb through radar, and it worked. Mm. We hit something. And you had radar because you were the lead ship, but only... And we were the lead ship, right. Mm. And then uh, March 17th was our ninth mission. We had a good target today, Hanover. The trip didn't take too long, but it wasn't the easiest target. We didn't get bothered, but others did and we were flying gambling lady again. That was our own ship, 409. Chaff, as mentioned in Mission 7, was one of the few tools airplanes had to defend against the deadly flak being hurled at the sky. Chaff that we were, I had talked about, was these little uh, rolled up pieces of silver paper or silver strips that would act in their radar as an airplane and it would, their flak would be following that sometimes. Mm. It seemed like we were coming into the target and there was flak all over in front of us. And sure behold, it started drifting off. Mm. So it must have been the formation ahead of us that dropped this silver paper and it caught their uh, radar and they were shooting at that and, and so we missed, we went right through and we didn't hit any flags. Sometimes it wasn't just about dropping bombs on your enemies. Sometimes it was about dropping aid to your own side. This was a big push on, in the beginning of a big push. We didn't drop any bombs, we dropped supplies. Oh, to be dropped in a, to the glider troops over the Rhine. 
we came in very low, a few hundred feet, and got out as soon as we could. But we had, for uh, our drop, we had big wicker baskets filled with uh, uh, medical supplies mm -hmm. for the troops that had dropped, and they were uh, in the woods. We saw crashed gliders mm -hmm. and uh, <coughs> paratroopers, uh, but we were just to drop supplies for them to help them. We had a group of three ships and we were hit. A couple of hydraulics lines were cut with the projectile. I don't know what it was. But we didn't know what it was. We believed a 30 caliber, I doubt that. Glenn sure did a good job of buzzing on the way out. It was in the upper, and though we were going into the ground, we landed at Woodbridge, an emergency field, and picked up another plane. That may not convey the emotion, but this was a very near miss, and one of the few times John remembers being truly afraid. We thought our hydraulic lines had been shot out because they were just, it was squirting out of this thing all over the ship. And they're flammable, but not like gasoline. Mm -hmm. So uh, once he got that stopped, it kind of dried out in the ship. And uh, then we weren't sure we had brakes because we didn't know how much damage that hydraulic fluid that we lost. And that's when we went in for that landing. And I saw here he was buzzing the field, and I thought he was coming in for a landing, and his wheels weren't down. So I was screaming, your wheels are down. And uh, so then uh, somebody woke me up and got me settled, and <laughs> I was a little upset. That's putting it lightly, but his fear was certainly justified. Attempting to land with no brakes, or worse, no landing gear, could easily turn into a fiery crash, which is why from then on, John had a special name for the plane's engineer, Pete. At one time that we fixed this uh, uh, cut hydraulic line, I was in back by then, see, and I could see that, and he took care of it, you know. So I call him my hero, he likes that. <laughs> This big push, John mentioned, was a successful part of the Allied advance from Paris to Rhine and was one of the final phases of the Western European campaign. But the war was not over yet. March 30th was our 11th mission. Today, Good Friday, we made our 11th mission over the shipyard at Willemshaven. That's a coastal port and it was supposed to be quite a target, and we heard it was bad for the group after us, but it wasn't bad for us. Flak was light, but it came pretty close. And the flight was over the North Sea and only lasted five hours and 55 minutes, but it took all day. Briefing at 6.45 a.m., takeoff at 8.45, and zero hour was at 12 o'clock. We didn't get back until 4.30 p.m., so it was a whole day. As the nose gunner, John was sometimes removed from some of the damage and chaos going on behind him. Sometimes, when he thought a mission wasn't that bad for us, he later found out it was. My engineer said we came back sometime with a hundred holes in the plane, and I don't remember seeing that. As the war neared its end, years of bombing, fighting, and burning had reduced Europe to rubble, difficult to witness, even for those whose job it was to drop the bombs. Twelfth mission. Today we flew our first mission as the lead squad. We took off with 13 men, and this was one of the lowest, one of the longest, but easiest missions. We hit a small town in Czechoslovakia. Coming back, we saw the Raymachen Bridge, or what remained of it, and much of the battle lines. We saw miles of bomb craters and shell holes. It was really terrible. The whole town's destroyed. We were on oxygen about four hours and saw no planes or flak. So we must have been over enemy territory and 
our territory also. John's 13th and final mission was just days before the war ended in Europe, and he and his crew almost didn't live to see that day. We had another of a messed up raids today. We were this supposed is, to raid a place. This is the 13th? This was 13th, oh. yeah, way down by Austria near the Danube, but everything went wrong. We were supposed to lead a low left squadron, and we were, until we flew through clouds, and everyone scattered so they wouldn't hit each other. And that's another one where we came out of clouds, and we oh, yeah. and saw another. That's true, even, like, what about the plane flying next to you? Like, you can't even see them, so how do you know if you're getting close to well, them? Well, you, you, yeah. It was a very dangerous thing when you'd had that happen because here you are in clouds, so you can't see, well, you could see maybe the ship next to you, but then you come out of these clouds and here comes a whole formation against you and you're going straight at them. Yeah. So the planes were just going every which way and you never get together again because you've just scattered. Yeah. And, and I don't know if anybody hit anybody else. We don't even ever hear that. We found a crew from another group and a plane off our right wing was hit and went down. Oh, this is our last mission. That was because of the screw up. So then we were flying alone and we were going in, we were going to hit this little town somewhere. And uh, uh, here this other plane that got lost, they saw us, so they came and they were flying off our wing. And, and they were flying off our wing, and they were flying off our wing. All of a sudden, four shots came up, bing, bing, bing. And one of them hit their wing, the wing flipped over, and they went down like a rock. This was the last day. And, uh, and we were recalled and still got credit for a mission without dropping our bombs. Wow, we didn't even drop them. Usually they tell you, drop your bombs and come in. But this one didn't. It was pretty much the end of the war. And just like that, the war in Europe had ended. Left behind were tens of millions of dead, the smoldering remains of once great cities, and the shaken and exhausted survivors. John describes the day victory was announced in Europe, VE Day. This is VE Day in Europe, post of May 8, 1945. I must write a little about VE Day and what I did. We were all heard it was over, except for the official word from the big three, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin. Well, I went on a trolley run that day, and that, the trolley one was something Eisenhower, I guess, made up. He figured the ground crewmen had worked the area for four years, and they didn't see anything. So we would take up 20 or 30 of them, and fly over Ramagan and the Danube and some of the targets that were pretty well bombed mm. just to show them what would... Oh, you'd take them with you? Yeah, just to show them what they had accomplished by servicing our planes. Sure, sure. And uh, we flew over Belgium, or Brussels. I remember Churchill was giving a speech then and the pilot had turned that on so we could all listen to it. And uh, we flew over bombed uh, cities, and we flew over uh, trenches, and it seemed like a nightmare. The sun was shining, but it did not seem to bring any beauty like it seemed to everyone else. Almost the only thing standing was the cathedral. Now that was, next to the Raymagen Bridge was Cologne, and that cathedral was standing in the middle of this rubble and it looked so black and dead. And we didn't see a car, a street, or people walking. And all the buildings were almost all bombed. It sure was an awful sight. And I guess you will see pictures in the movies. And it could never be as bad as actually seen. Sometimes words fall short. Images and film can't show the whole picture. Some things are too terrible to simply describe. But for millions of young soldiers, the fight in Europe was either over or would be soon. In fact, for John, the fighting ended so abruptly, he didn't even get a chance to celebrate. 
When we got back, the war, they had announced that the war in Europe was ended, so we didn't have to go anywhere. So we were going to have our big party, I told you about. Mm. Oh, yeah. We had been saving our booze, and they were going to have wrens come in and had a dance there. And then they came and told us that, no, you're flying tomorrow, you can't have any booze. <laughs> so we missed the party. But we did fly home the next day. War is hell, and this was easily one of the worst in human history. But for John, the war was nearly over. In just a few weeks, while training to join the fight in Japan, he would meet Mary Duffy, the woman he would go on to marry, raise 11 children with, and cherish till the day he died. It was time to go home.